From that time on, Yeshua began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Thirty years growing up, watching sin and all kinds of things happen. Forty days in the desert, and finally he opens his mouth, mouth for the first words of his public ministry. And his words are, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He could have said anything. He could have said, pray, go to church, read the Bible, fast, a number of things. But he chose these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What does it mean and suggest that these are the words he chose after years of growing up, after going to the desert for the days, excited, uh, looking forward to starting his ministry and, and doing so many things. And these are his words, repent. It's extremely important to say the least. This is not the only time we see that. Not only that, John the Baptist called sinners to, yeah, you guessed it, repent. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And as we already know, John was laying the pathway for Yeshua to come. And this is his message. Coincidence? I think not. There is something important about repentance that we mustn't miss here. It's often and common to hear things like we need to believe and we need to pray, but we don't often hear words of repent, repentance in our culture, especially in the Christian dome in general. John also was baptizing water. With, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. See, these aren't words that just haphazardly being chosen. There is an intention here. Yeshua starting his ministry with it. John the Baptist is talking about come, repent, be baptized in a baptism of repentance. Not a coincidence. Peter also called sinners to repent. As he was teaching in on this lesson about what they did to Yeshua at the cross, they were convicted and cut to the hearts and wondered what they should do. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, he said. God has made this Yeshua whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter could have said anything. He had a captive audience waiting to hear his very words. He want, they wanted to know. What did he open his mouth up and say? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. He said, repent, repent, and be baptized. Every single one of you, not just some of you, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The message is still the same from Yeshua to John the Baptist, to Peter, whom, whom uh, Yeshua looked at and says, "You on this rock I will build. He's using these same words, repent. There's something important about repentance that we mustn't miss. Paul also, we see later, calling sinners to repent as they turn to God. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from, the, and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Yeshua. Paul proclaims, this is the message I've been teaching. Repent, turn. Yeshua sends out his 12 to do what? To preach about what? I'm going to give you one option. Mark 6, 6, it says Yeshua went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. They went out and preached that people should mm, repent. This is the message that Yeshua has surely put into their hearts and their mouths when he sent them out. They're cleansing spirits, they're healing, but their message has not deviated. They preach to the people that they should repent. Why am I sharing all this? Because we have to see the importance and the significance of this call to repentance. He doesn't want us to miss this message. Yeshua's mission was to call sinners to repentance. Sometimes we can get distracted by all the other messages out there when it comes to religion and Christianity and the Bible. And Yeshua says his own words, this is what I've come to do. 
We see in Luke 5, the, then Levi held a great banquet for Yeshua at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisee, Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to the sect complained to the disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Yeshua would answer them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Then he says this, I have not come to call the righteous. He has come to call, he says, but sinners to repentance. I think the message is clear now. We get the point. The call is to repentance. His first words, repentance. John the Baptist is paving the way with a baptism of repentance. Peter, repent and be baptized. Paul says to the Jews and the Greeks, I've preached, turn to God and repent. He sends out the 12 to repent. He's saying, this is why I'm here. Repentance. Why? Again, am I saying this? Laying the groundwork for why we need to understand in this study. What is repentance? And how does that look for me? Four steps to how we can repent. Biblically, what is most commonly viewed as repentance? The steps from repentance. Biblically. Here's a common verse. Revelation 3.19. It says, here I am. Yeshua was speaking. I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This scripture is often quoted to talk about how we need to respond to the call of Yeshua and allow him to enter into our hearts and our lives. We need to believe in him. And this is often misunderstood and left there and says, I believe. I believe that he's died and, 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 and I welcome him into my life. But I wonder if there's more to this. If we look one verse before, we don't often hear this verse preceded by it. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and there it is again. Repent. Then he follows up with here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. You see, opening the door was the repentance. Repent, turn, and open the door. It's not just a, an acceptance. It's a turning. It's a repentance. Be earnest and repent. We need to get this through our heads and into our spirits. This type of opening the door was the kind of get in the barrel faith. You know the story where the guy's walking across a tightrope and everyone's excited he goes from one end of the building to another without falling. And everybody's like, wow, you're amazing. He says, do you think I can do it again? Absolutely. Do you think I can do it with a barrel in my hand? Absolutely. Who wants to get in the barrel? And it's quiet. See, opening the door says, I need you to repent. I need you to get in the barrel and says, I really believe this. And I'm going all in. Will I perish if I don't repent? Is this really that big of an issue? Will I die? You know, sometimes we ask questions like that. Do we need to in order to stay alive, survive? What about eternal life? I'll read Yeshua's words here. Now, there was some present at that time who told Yeshua about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Yeshua answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too all will perish. He didn't pull punches. Sometimes we're very careful in our in words not to hurt and offend people. He says, you thought that was bad. Consider those who choose not to repent. Oh, my. All of them will perish. And he continues on. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all others, all others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. All right. I think we've laid the groundwork now. Repentance is very important. If you don't understand fully or want to be reminded, you want to pay attention here. Because now we're seeing the depth of it, even in this last passage. You will die. He says every single one of you will perish, likely considering both in this life and the next life to come. You will not make it unless you repent. Do you have the right understanding 
the biblical understanding, Yeshua's understanding, Yahweh's understanding of what he means when he says repent. Here's some questions we're going to ask in this study. Was repentance really a big deal in scripture? I think we've established that. Can lack of repentance become a salvation issue? How is repentance defined in both Hebrew and Greek so that we can understand the biblical sense of it? What does a person's mind have to do with repentance? What is commonly taught or thought of as repentance, but actually isn't repentance? What are the four biblical steps that, are, that often accompany repentance? And lastly, what's the relationship between repentance and being fruitful? So let's start with the definition in Hebrew. If we go to Hebrew, a word, if you're familiar with um, Hebrew a little bit, you may have heard the word teshuva come up to talk about repentance, because that is the word for repentance. And particularly, that's the noun form. But it, but it comes from another word that we see here in 7725, the verb form, which is the root. Um, the noun form means a recurrence and an answer or returning. The now the verb form is the primitive root means to return or turn back. So finally, we start to get a sense of what this repentance is talking about. It's the idea of going back to wherever you came from. It doesn't have to mean with God. It literally just means to return back to your place of origin. Wherever you just came, go back there. So some ways that it's used are as follows. In Genesis 3, 9, it says in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread to you. Shub. So this word is shub coming from Teshuba, or where actually Teshuba comes from shub. So this is not as fun a word. We're used to word uh, Teshuba, but as a verb um, form, you'll see shub. So it says to you shub, which means return to the ground. Why? Because that's where you came from. You're going back there. For out of it, you were taken for dust you are into dust you shall shub. You shall return. So that's the idea of repentance. In Hosea 14, 2, we see take words with you and do what? Return to Yahweh. In this sense, returning back to Yahweh, assuming and implying that we were already there. Matter of fact, we were all already there. That's where we come from. Adam and Eve, since the beginning, he's been seeking to return and reconcile his relationship with man so that he can finally be at one with him as before. It says, continue and say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. In Psalms 51, as David prays after his sin with Bathsheba, he asks for restoration, to be restored, to shub. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will do what? turn back. So restore to me, help me to turn back and get the joy that I once had so that I can call others to turn back to you. And I just want to say this again, that this idea of turning back to Yahweh deeply implies and shows that that's where we were originally. He wants us back to be united with him. It's not about observing laws, commands. And while we will do those things, he wants reconciliation an intimate relationship with us. That's why sin has become so important because it separates us from having that restoration, that reunion, that intimacy that in Hebrew is called echad, that oneness with him. One more example in Limitations 3, it says, let us examine our ways and test them and let us shub to Yahweh. Let's return. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, we have sinned and rebelled and you have not forgiven. So as we look in the Hebrew, and this is where uh, you get a very clear and powerful definitions, because the Greek that we see in the New Testament is coming from that, from the Septuagint. They translated it from Hebrew to Greek. But we really get a great sense of this idea of returning. So we don't want to miss what Yeshua is trying to say as his first words. Repent, return, go back to where you uh, belong to God. And I can just say those words and end this lesson here because I do believe that as we hear those words, we know what that means for ourselves right now to say return, go back. There are some thinking, there are some practices that we've acquired that are that have moved away from what he's established to call us near to him. And we should return back to that. We looked at Hebrew uh, definition, but it's also important to look at the Greek because it comes up 
we're going to be watch, looking at a few scriptures in um, the Greek as well. This word translated in Greek is the word metanoia. Metanoia, you may recognize some parts of this at least because meta talks about change or being transformed and noia has the suffix of talking about one's mind like a paranoid um, paranoia and things like that. So when you put these two together, we get a change in one's mind example to repent. So they're trying to get at the same idea of turning back. But you're not just turning back physically, you're turning back within inside your own mind and your being. So that's why in Acts 238, when Peter says, repent, metanoia, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. People, thousands were baptized. Well, how? They repented. How could they repent? Well, because the change had occurred within them. In their own minds, in their spirit, they said, I'm done. I'm turning back. I'm going. So that's what is able to occur. It's not just a physical. And we'll talk more about this as we go through the study. But it starts in our own minds, in our own spirits, in our own attitudes. And I think the Greek starts to pull this out. So this turning back, God doesn't just want activities. He doesn't want just sacrifices and, and lip service, as we know from many scriptures. He wants a turning of our hearts and our minds. This is why throughout scripture, there is such an emphasis on what is in our minds and how we should make up our minds. Romans 12, 2, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your noise, <laughs> your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. As we grow in the Messiah, there are going to be many opportunities for us to be to encounter something new that we hadn't seen before. It's going to be challenging. It's going to call us to revoke traditions or ideas that didn't align or simply go deeper in our maturity of how we practice certain principles that he's called us. We need to continue to renew our minds. What does that mean? Repentance doesn't simply happen at uh, one time at a decision we made to follow him. It's a constant renewing, renewing, renewing. And this part really gets a lot of uh, believers and churches in troubles because we find a really comfortable place and we stop renewing. We say, I already know what the gospel says. I already know what it means to me. My mom and everyone I know has been doing this for a long time and we get stuck. This protects us against the conforming to the pattern of this world we'll slowly start to get more and more conformity and unity with the world if we're not renewing our mind, challenging our beliefs, challenging our attitudes and asking, do they still align with scriptures? So a lack of renewing one's mind leads to uh, selfish desires, selfish pleasures and saying, this is what I want. Why? Because we're built to seek comfort. We want what works for us. Which brings us to eight, Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their what? Minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It starts in the mind. So when we're talking about repentance and returning back, we must first ask ourselves, am I returning in my mind? I always use this example. And if you've heard my videos and teachings, you've heard this before of the little girl who was told to sit down and kept refusing. She says, I will not sit down. And she eventually, after so many minutes, sat down. She says, on the outside, I'm sitting down, but on the inside, I'm standing up. I'm standing up. Why? Because my mind has not changed. My attitude is still the same. God says a mind that is set against him, that is seeking pleasures of his own, is hostile to him like a terrorist. You may be thinking, I didn't do anything. I didn't commit murder. I didn't actually lie. I didn't. He says, but your heart is still seeking the things that you're focused on. A repent, a repentance person's mind is no longer set on those things. A repentance person's mind is set on how can I please and follow God and follow his spirit. Satan realizes the power of this mind as well. 
So instead of trying to change the whole world and change the things in front of us, all he has to do, you guessed it, is change our mind, change how we're thinking. That way he can draw us away. That's the whole reason we need to be drawn back and return. So we saw this in Genesis, right? When he spoke to Eve, he says, you're not surely die. Asking about, am I going to die for Eve? You're not going to die. This conversation is all about how can I get in your head and get you to think differently? Because when what when what you see changes, when how you see something changes, what you're looking at changes. So if I can get you to think about it differently, it changes all of a sudden. And we're going to see that happen here. If you haven't read this spoiler alert. The serpent said to the woman for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Look at that. How powerful. Nothing changed with the tree. Nothing changed with the fruit. Nothing changed with the serpent at a grass or Eve. Everyone is still physically nothing changed. Eve turned away from God's principles in her mind. Satan was effective at pulling her away from God's principles and getting her to see, you know what? That same fruit will get you to be like God. Look how tasty it is. You'll become wise. If I can just get in your mind, he's saying, all the work is done. Repentance is going to start with turning back in our minds. James shows this progression. In James, it says he shows the progression how we are drawn away in our minds, in our attitudes, in our spirits. Let no one say when he is tempted. Speaking of temptation, we just saw I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So we saw that. Seeking the fleshly desires. We saw Eve being drawn away, drawn away. Now, she hadn't sinned from being drawn away. She could have easily come back and repented. She hadn't actually uh, uh, um, bought the goods yet and said, OK, I'm going to do this. It just being drawn away. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. There it is. And this process happens in moments. All that drawing away and the sin that gives, uh, gives birth, that happens and that gives birth to death. All this stuff happens in a moment. Sometimes it happens over weeks, months or years. But there's a slowing drawing away. I know I've been subject to that. Been constantly tempting in my heart and my mind, constantly thinking, what, what's going on? Being drawn away. Is that really you start? It starts with great questions. Do we really have to do that? Is this really necessary? Will I really die? It's questions. When you start hearing yourself ask questions about God's principles that are drawing you away from holiness. You are in this process and it's time to repent and return. And sometimes you might have to interrupt that whole process by saying it aloud. Satan, you are a liar. I'm going back to God's principles. So that's why we need to practice mind control, <laughs> we, our self mind control. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Think about these things. Think about these things. Why am I being called to renew my mind? Why am I being called to think about these things? Because if I can control my thinking and direct my thinking and fix my thinking in the right place, then I can stay close to my father. And there's not a need to constantly repent and keep coming back because I'm not drawn away. Now, practically, what does that mean? We are in a world where we're inundated with all kinds of ideas that do not represent God's principles. Some of them very, uh, uh, um, in your face and overt, some of them very subtle and covert. We have to become more aware of what these are and where they're coming from 
and be intentional about only letting in those things that are what? True, noble, right, pure, lovely, excellent, praiseworthy. You know, those things that make you feel great and closer to God and holiness. Those are the things we should be seeking and embracing. OK, let me get more practical because we're in 2024 um, and we have uh, a lot of technology, media and everything's vying for our attention. That's really the name of the game. Attention. Can I get your attention? I need to get you to focus on this. What do you focus on? Are the is the what if, is what going in is what going are the things that are going into your eyes and your ears in alignment with holiness, with alignment what is true and noble, right, pure, lovely, excellent, and praiseworthy. See, these are the gates of our mind, our eyes and our ears. Are how well are you guiding guarding those areas? What am I watching? What kind of social media am I on? What is it doing for me? I can attest that it doesn't do a whole lot of good unless I go into that space very intentionally looking for something that's true, noble, right, excellent or praiseworthy. I'm going to be inundated and baptized with all types of ideas. Some of them, again, overtly uh, uh, lewd and sinful. Others are very subtle in you in your window and suggestive. So we need to be careful of what we're watching. What kind of movies am I watching? What kind of shows am I following? For the author and writer of these shows do not have in mind 99% of the time what Yahweh has in mind. He, they do not have in mind creating a uh, excellent and praiseworthy worthy place for your spirit to rejoice. What kind of music am I listening to? I've constantly had to reevaluate the music and what it's doing in my spirit, what is being said. These aren't just words and I'm saying them. Is that OK? It's so commonly accepted that we don't think. But these things cause us to self-sabotage because we're introducing struggles that don't have to be. Now we're, we've created a stumbling block in front of ourselves of temptation, of, of subtle thoughts in our subconscious mind, in our spirits. And now we're trying to figure out why am I struggling? Why do I want to buy more things? Why do I feel like I need to chase beauty? Why do I need um, to be in this or that relationship? And all these ideas. But they don't align. They don't align with him. Even the company we keep. What am I letting in? What kind of conversations? There's been many times I've had to stop people right in the middle of the sentence because it goes to a very gossipy tone or it becomes a very uh, a, a negative venting type of spirit. And we have to say, OK, we're not going to talk about people like that and we're not going to entertain that. Whatever's excellent or praiseworthy, we have to be careful. We can do these things in a righteous way. Input things that align with his holiness. Remind yourself of his beauty. Remind yourself of his great promises. Write it down. Look at it in your journal. You have to be extremely aggressive with bringing this into your mind, because if you're not, you are dying and you are being uh, uh, assaulted by the attack of the world. If you do nothing, if you just go about your day, shop, work, whatever, you are constantly being assaulted by ideas that do not represent Yahweh. Because you're going to think this is common. This is how people talk. This is how people dress. This is their attitude. Look at that billboard. I should buy this. It's constant. But we need to remind ourselves in prayer and reading his word and, and getting in front of holy things that this is how we need to watch our minds. And then we talked about what repentance is. We looked at it in Hebrew. We looked at it in Greek. Um, we talked about how it's it's so much a turning around, even in our spirits and our minds. We, we need to be careful of that. But what is it not? I love to define things by looking at their contrast, contrast often because it makes it very clear. What is repent? What repentance is not? Well, if we look at the Oxford English Dictionary, it defines repentance as feeling or expressing sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing. This is a bad translation for them to put the word repent in in English. People are actually thinking, I feel terrible about what I just did. And because they feel terrible about what just did, they feel like 
I'm alive and that's a good thing. It's a, it is a good thing to feel terrible, but that is not metanoia and that's not Teshuba. That is feeling sorry and terrible for what you did as you should. Um, if repentance, um, and so, so people are stopping there and thinking that they're along the line of salvation and they already done that part. I repented because look how bad I felt, but I need to correct that. And we already corrected that by showing that, no, this is a turning around in our thinking. This is a turning around in our behavior and returning back to where you came from, not just sitting and wallowing in your sorrow, because if sitting and wallowing in your sorrow is all we needed to do, then uh, Judas Iscariot would have repented. But I think we all know he didn't repent. The same word is used here. In Matthew 27, 3, it says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, he was what? Remorseful. He was full of guilt. And brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. He hanged himself. Repentance does not lead, does not lead to suicide. Really being sorry, sorrowful. See, there's there's two types of sorrow that Paul points out. Godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. So having a worldly sorrow will lead to death. What was me? I just messed up. Oh, my gosh, it's so terrible. I'm so embarrassed. It's so foolish. I don't want to talk about it. that whole line of thinking is death. But godly repentance leads to something different. A godly sorrow leads to something different. So let's first of all, what it's not repentance is not is feeling bad and remorseful. That is important and necessary, as we'll see here in Paul's letter. And Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church that really convicted him and they felt terrible. And he followed up with these words. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it, though I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you where? To repentance. You see, godly sorrow for you became. I'm just going to read. it. I was going to go off. But for you became sorrowful as God intended. And so we're not harmed in any way by us. Verse 10, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Worldly sorrow brings death. But godly sorrow, this is how you know the difference. Both people are going to feel terrible. Well, at least hopefully you're feeling terrible. Some people don't feel terrible. But hopefully that's the first step is I feel terrible. But what happens after that? is really a testament to, is this repentance or is this something else? Matter of fact, we can start to see whether or not that's repentance by what comes after that. So here's some fruit. He says, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. You know, as we reflect on what Judas did, he started that route. He did what was right. He's like, this money is not good and returned and gave that back to him. What he wanted to clear himself. But at the end, he sat in worldly sorrow that led to death. But godly sorrow should bring about these types of fruits. So if you're ever wondering if you repent and start checking for this fruit, am I eager to um, clear myself? Uh, do I have indignation? I hate this. I'm absolutely. Uh, what alarm, what longing to see justice. I want to have justice done. If I need to repay someone, if I need to apologize, if I need to go back to God and fast, or I want to, I want to make this right and not just sit and wallow in it. Four steps, four steps that we see, uh, in the scriptures leading us through repentance that I, that I, saw as a model. And there's probably more or less that you can make of this, but we'll just look at these four. First one is confession. Confession was so important that before the um, yearly offering that Aaron would make, Yahweh created a, a, a practice of confessing all the sins of Israel over it. 
Leviticus 16 verse 21 says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. Now, before we just read over that and accept it as just like, okay, yeah, that's what he did. Understand that Aaron didn't come up with this practice. This was not a practice that he pulled from some pagans that he saw. This is Yahweh saying, this is what he shall do. Put your hands on it. And they would literally press into it as if to push their authority, the authority and themselves into it and to say there's a, there's a transfer of guilt. So he pressed into it and confessed. Why? You already know what's going on, God. Why do I have to say it? You know my mind and my heart and you've seen it. Why do I have to say it? Because he says so. Whatever reason he has, he made it clear. Now we can we can give some conjectures as to why this would be important. But it was so important that he says, make sure this is a part of the process. Now I'm thinking about all your sins. How long was he there? <laughs> um, sometimes it's easy just to pray, forgive me for all my sins, period. But he was counting, recounting sins, I'm sure, to some category about what was done. But that was a part of it. Yahweh says this needs to be the case. Um, anytime conf um, confession leads to Yahweh remembering his covenant. So here's a reason why this is important. He says, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and their treachery that they committed against me and also walking contrary to me so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. And I remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. And, my, and I remember the land. Trust us. Trust me. Or trust the scriptures. We want Yahweh to remember his covenant. We want Yahweh to remember his promise of blessings that he's given. And he says, if you confess your iniquity, you confess your sin and the sins even of your fathers. We see the iniquity of their fathers. He says confession is a part of this. We cannot skip over that. We have to open our mouths and share that and talk. We were called to confess when we can't confess something we don't know. So Yahweh called to confess as soon as it became apparent that we had uh, committed a crime or a sin against him. In Numbers 5, 6, it says when a man or woman commits any of the sins that people commit by breaking faith with Yahweh and that person realizes his guilt, he shall confess his sin that he has committed. So this was something to be done as soon as you realize, oh, my, I messed up. Let me confess what I just did here. In confession, um, we see this also in, in Nehemiah. Nehemiah uh, chapter 9, I believe, the men realized where it was brought to their attention that they were marrying, marrying foreign women. And in this term, foreign women, it was women who were pagan, worshiping other gods, and they were wrong. So they were challenged to come forth and deal with that situation. In verse 9, 1, it says, Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their father. So we see this again, confessing of their sins and their iniquities. They could have just kept it to themselves. Like, why are we confessing? We all know what happened because this was a big calling. Ezra called all the people from all over Judah. And he says, if you don't come, you're going to get kicked out of the community. This is a big deal. We all know why we're here. But we need to confess. I need to open my mouth and say what happened. This is not just an Old Testament phenomenon for those who are thinking, okay, you showed a lot of Old Testament scriptures. As people were coming to John the Baptist for the baptism of repentance, guess what they were doing publicly? Matthew 3. Then Jerusalem and all the Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Confessing. I have wronged. I have lied. I have stolen. I have been impure or immoral. I have confessing. Wow. And publicly. When's the last time you've seen that? You don't see that every day. Like, I'm not going to talk about that. But it's easy to talk about when you've decided that this is behind you, not in front of you and not with you. Oh, that's what I used to do. Right. It's easy to talk about things we used to do. Like, I am done with that. I don't care what you think about it. I'm just trying to make sure I'm right with him. And I'm so excited about it. I'm just caught up with my love and his love for me. You deal with your own sin. 
And trust me, we all got our stuff. When we find out someone's sin and they confess, the only difference between us and that person is I know what you did, but they don't know what I did. The point is, we all got something to confess. As soon as it comes to our minds, we need to be confessing it. And we see publicly these things happening. This also happened publicly in Acts 19. Um, When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Yeshua was held in high honor. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. So as they talked about Yeshua, and they talked about the gospel, it became aware that they were wrong, and it led to confessing and divulging their practices. They're being all open. You remember what Paul said about what happens with godly sorrow that leads to repentance? He says, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourself. I want to get this out. I want to dispel the power it has inside of me. There is power that it has sitting inside of my um, spirit, inside of my chest and my mind. But when I say it and I speak this, get this out of me. Now, even besides that, that feeling is commanded. Even we saw it, it, it seems very strongly expected from God. Confess your sins. At least everyone in the Old Testament and New Testament seems to understand very clearly this phenomenon or this practice. James even encourages, even encourages or continues to encourage us that sometimes we incur, uh, uh, confess our sins to one another. He says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There are some who are not being healed because of lack of confession. Who would have thought that simply not confessing and holding that in will cause pain, will cause someone to to uh, body to break down? All kinds of things going on. We only look at things in our in the American culture oftentimes through a scientific and rational lens. Where did this come from? What's the biology behind it? But we know very clearly those of us who who read scripture and connect with the spiritual world. See, we're we're living um, in the duality of reality, the reality of duality. There's two worlds: there's a physical and the spiritual. And this everything is spiritual, but it shows up physical. So we see that in this phenomenon, it says confess so that you can be healed so we can pray for you and you can be healed. Some things you're locked up on that are causing there's no medication. There's no prescription that's going to help. That is really you confessing and repenting. So why confess? We've kind of touched on this already, but I want to make sure we draw this home. First, John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then also in Psalms 32, we hear of David. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to Yahweh and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Why confess? One, it's commanded. It seems really important from old and new. It seems expected very clear on the pathway to repentance. It's something that's a fruit that follows repentance. Like, I want to clear myself. I want to get this out. I want to uh, make it public, disarm the power of it. I want to be in alignment with what God wants. But also we see forgiveness follows that. Forgive us our sins. Um, second step. Ask for forgiveness. Speaking of forgiveness. So we talked about confessing. And while they do go hand in hand, they're a little bit different. Confessing is acknowledging, humbly acknowledging that I'm wrong and, and, and admitting what that wrong was. Forgiveness, for asking for forgiveness is just that. Now move on to please forgive me. That implies you have the power to forgive me and I messed up and I did something wrong. It's humbling. Even from person to person, oftentimes, if we have to go and ask for forgiveness, it can be humbling. If you're more prideful, I heard a statement that was really sobering that says you can't humiliate a humble person. Why? Because they already realize that they are uh, they're they're growing. They're not perfect. I'm like, how are you going to humiliate? You're already humble. But forgiveness requires or implies that something was done wrong. And I'm asking for you to forgive me. We see this in Yeshua's prayer as he's teaching. He says he said to them, when you pray. Father, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Forgive us our sins. In the short prayer that he provided as a blueprint for how we should pray, Yeshua included this. He says, 
be sure to say, forgive us our sins. Forgive me. It's easy to assume that, okay, I'm feeling bad already. You know that I'm wrong. I'm confessing what the wrong was, but you actually need to say, forgive me. Have mercy on me. And speaking of having mercy, we see David in Psalms 51 say the same thing. He asked for forgiveness. After his sin with Bathsheba, committing adultery, have mercy on me, O God. And what a great template for prayer for any of us finding ourselves in sin and wanting to be returned, wanting to confess and ask for forgiveness and return back to Yahweh. What a great template. We can read this and use this as a benchmark or a um, uh, to catapult us into our own prayers. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression, see, it's, it's been made known to him. And my sins is always before me against you and you alone. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely, surely I was sinful at birth, si sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desire faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop. You see, hyssop was often included in the cleansing process. Cleanse me. He's asking, forgive me. Remove this and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. You see, there are the bones being crushed and going back again. When we don't ask for forgiveness, when we don't confess, when we don't repent, um, sometimes it can be a crushing feeling. Um, I think I'm reminded of a, uh, a, a psalm that talks about that. Um, when I kept silent. Thank you, Father. Forgive me that. Uh, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through the, my yearning all day. Uh, when I kept silent, I want to speak. I want to get this out. I want healing. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. We might need to pause right now and make that prayer. If there is something that comes to your mind and your spirit as we talk about repentance, confession, asking for forgiveness, just these first two steps. Why wait? Why say I'll do that later? You may not have later. If you're driving, you're walking, you're sitting. Why not? Why, why not do it now? Pause and say. Forgive me. I want to confess that this, that and the other. I did this and I thought this and I, my heart has been. Forgive me. And now let's go to the third one. Turn from sin. Turn from sin. We mustn't only turn our minds and actions away from what we know is wrong. We mustn't just turn in that sense. But our behavior must follow. Not just our minds, but our actions and behavior must follow. Turn from sin. Yeshua explicitly shows us what this should look like. And how we can deal with sin. Should we realize that we, there is some present? Matthew 18, it says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Repentance is about turning back to God, not just in pretense in our words, not just in our emotions because we felt bad and we want to confess and ask for forgiveness, but also we need to deal with the sin that's present. If there is anything causing us to sin, I've had, I've known people to cut off their internet. I've known people to get rid of their phones. I know I've known people to uh, reevaluate relationships, causing them sin. There may be items in your room or home or workplace that you say this, this, this tempts. This gets me to think about uh, th these thoughts that don't align with Yahweh. I want to get rid of all these things that don't, that do not promote the holiness that I'm being called to. I want to repent. And I will say that hearing these words 
are so strong and terminal, aren't they? Cut it off. This this uh, yells in the face of what's popular in our culture when it when it comes to dealing with sin. Not they don't call it that, but just in general challenges or habits or things that we addictions that we want to get rid of. He says, cut it off. Gouge it out. Cut, throw, gouge. Notice there's no three, four and 10 step plan. I'll work on that over the next six months. There's no gradual release for sin. I got to say that because I know that someone listening right now has said that to themselves that I'm working on that. Um, There's only three things he said here. Cut it off. Throw it away. Gouge it out. Cut, (laughs) throw, gouge. It's done. Get rid of it. And if he's saying that, it means he's given us the power to do that. But we give ourselves an out. We leave the back door open in case we ever need to go back there. And he's not talking about that. He's not talking. About, repentance is not kind of returning back to him. Well, I'm kind of either you're turning or you're not. Either you're saying I'm done and I'm confessing and I'm moving on. Thank you, God. I'm free from. Or you're still playing with the sin. Why can I say this? Because I've heard it in my own spirit many times, my mind. Man, we're good at justifying sin. We're good at giving ourselves a 13 point plan, a one year to do this or do that. And we look for others, look to others as justification. Look, this person I respect, they kind of doing it. Look, Yeshua is your master. We should look to him and follow his guidance. And he says, cut it off, throw it away, gouge it out. You can do it. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Well, I got some. I need to go back. No. Cut it off. We also see this language as Paul talks about him. Put to death. All right. This is step three. Step three is we got to deal with the sin. This can't just be an emotional experience of saying I felt bad. You actually have to deal with the sin. Put to death. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity. Lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. Notice that behind us in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Same language. Everyone understood it. This is not a reduction in the severity or the frequency of any sin. Let me reduce it. And we, we celebrate those, right? Like, man, you should have known how much I used to do, how bad it, it was before. And it's so hard. And amen, that we're going the right direction. But the prescription that he gave us is clear. Put it to death. Not a slow choking out. Cut it off. Gouge it out. Put it to death. This should be a complete cessation, death. And he gives us a lot of examples. Uh, Sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. And I hear it, but I'm human. I'm human. I know that's why we have these temptations. That's why we have these desires, because we're human. But we also have the Holy Spirit with us and we're repenting, turning to God. And Yeshua told us we could. So we have the ability to deny ourselves. Okay, he says this over and over again in the Gospels. Deny yourself. It's not a sin to be tempted by it. It's not a sin to have these things wrestling in our flesh. But we need to say no. It's when we say yes that we get in trouble. The human part is that we still have these desires, these longings, these cravings. So don't make it worse by watching and listening and being around Uh, influence, as we mentioned before, cut it off. Josiah, uh, I want to look at Josiah's story. Josiah wanted to restore worship to Yahweh the way it should be. To further highlight the importance of turning from sin, I want to look at Josiah's efforts as he brought back true worship to Yahweh. Let's take note of what he did at this point. So we talked about confessing, asking for forgiveness, And now turning from sin, 
The first thing he did, Second Kings 23, 1, he says he laid down the word of God as a standard for that for which they will follow. This brought clear awareness to everybody now. So it says we read already that when you become aware, confess when you become aware. I didn't even know I was doing that one. When you become aware, he laid down the standard. Then the king called together all the elders, elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And he went up to the temple of Yahweh with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets. All the people from the least to the greatest, he read in their hearing, hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which he had, which had been found in the temple of Yahweh. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of Yahweh to follow Yahweh and keep his commands, statutes and decrees with all his heart and his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant, to the covenant. The covenant is a promise. So it's, a, it's a agreement, a, a very powerful one that says, I will do this and you will do this. Here, here are the terms of those conditions by which we will operate. And that's what we get in his word, in his Torah, in the scriptures. Josiah returned to that. He says, I pledge this is our standard. This is what we're going to do. And we need to continue to repledge ourselves. And I'm saying this because if you've been around the Bible and religion long enough, you may be thinking, yeah, I already did that. This is a constant repledging. Every single day I have to wake up. Every single day you have to wake up and recommit yourself to Yeshua is the, my Lord. Yahweh is my master. I'm following his Torah is what I'm upholding. This is what I'm about. I'm recommitting to that. And I'm constantly renewing my mind to see is there anything in my life that needs to be purged out so that I can be a better vessel for him. So he, he laid that standard. What did he do next? Then he got to work on this step three, removing the sin. He pulled down the altars the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz and the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of Yahweh. He removed from there, smashed them to pieces and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem, the south of the hill of corruption. The one Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the vile god, goddess of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the vile god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the site with human bones. He completely destroyed this stuff. See, it wasn't just about, I'm going to read this and I repent. I'm not going to do that again. He says, no, there's some work we need to do now. And you might be at that point. You may just at this point in the lesson have realized there are some things in your life that you need to repent of, that you need to turn from. But you can't turn and not deal with those elements, not deal with those practices. Whatever that is, for some, it may be uh, uh, certain people. It may be certain uh, media that you're watching. It may be a certain uh, drug over the counter or not. Um, alcohol, cigarettes sugar. I've even had to watch my uh, eating of sugar because of addictive nature it has and says, no, this is not getting my temple the way I, where I need it to be. Whatever it is, everything I had to say, this needs to go, needs to be torn down. And it can be a painful process, but it should be one that is elevating and inspiring because we're finally freeing ourselves from this thing and no longer holding on to it as a God. Notice these are all different types of gods, gods they were offered children to and bleed them out and kill them and all these crazy things, destroy them. But I've gotten so much security from them. They make me feel good. And this is where I go to. And God is jealous because of that. He says, I want that love. I want that time. I want that passion. I want you to come to me now as your rock and your salvation. Repent. Turn to God is going to include turning away from this sin, which includes cutting it off, gouging it out, throwing it away, destroying it, smashing it, desecrating the places. I will pause this and write down what does that look like for you right now? What does that look like for what you're letting into your eyes and ears, for the company you're keeping, for the habits that you form, for the addictions that you have? What sin is present that you just is reeking out right now in your mind and saying this has to go? It may not be anything. Praise Yahweh. And if that's the case, we know what to do once it comes to our mind. Once we realize, oh, there's something here. 
I had a, a thought about this. I've been entertaining this in my heart. That needs to get out. Throw off anything that hinders anything. You know, I like what it says in Hebrews 12 to this sentiment. It says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Throw it off. We have the tendency to continue to carry this things, these things with us. I might need that later, but I don't, I've been so used to using this for so long. I've been so used to this sin. Well, surely God will continue to forgive me. Don't mock his grace. We should look at a previous study we talked about on sin and um, intentional sin and how we can't do that. Throw it off. Everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Notice the difference. The distinction he makes between things that hinder and sin. See, there are some things that are, may not be outright sin, but they're hindering. Throw that off, too. You may be like, oh, this is a gray area. Throw that off, too. We don't do gray areas no more. We're holiness. We, we come in the white robes. Throw off everything that hinders and let us run. We are not able to run with the conviction and with the passion that God has given us because we're still holding on to things from the past. We're still holding on to malice and anger and lust and impurity and sin and deceit and all these things in us. We can't run with passion. I'm amazed at how we can see how passionate the world is. Because they get so deep into whatever their craft is, whatever their world in this, it takes over them, how they talk and how they become, how they dress. It's, it should be even more so for those of us who believe that Yahweh is real and what is coming is real and his blessings and rewards are real. We should be fanatics about seeking and running into that righteousness. Let us run with perseverance to race mark, already marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Yeshua the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, he went through this tough stuff. He suffered because he was focused on the joy set before him, scorning his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endures such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We will not grow weary and lose heart if we were reminded of what Yeshua went through because he was being pulled by something he was excited he was excited about. And that's you and me having union in the chad and oneness with the father. He's, he's pulled by that. We should be pulled by what's coming. Uh, the, and later on in, in, in this, uh, right before this chapter in Hebrews 11, this talks about they're longing for a heavenly home, looking forward to that home whose foundations aren't built by men. I'm looking forward to it. We should run with that same perseverance. You remember that Yeshua did the same thing. For the truth of the matter is we're holding on to stuff because they're comfortable and we really haven't struggled. You know, we talk about, oh, this is tough. Fasting. This is tough. Cutting down the Asherah pose, cutting down the sin, stopping the addictions, turning that TV or that phone off and not watching this anymore, doing that. We, we, that's not a struggle. He said the, the author of Hebrew goes on to say, let's be honest. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Mm. All them struggles that we say, oh, it's tough, it's hard. He says, let's be honest, you ain't struggled. Remember Yeshua. He, he struggled to the point where all his blood pierced in the side and all. You have not struggled that, to that point. I'm struggling. This is tough. I need a 13 point, 13 day plan. He says, you, you, you're not struggling. You can do it. You can deny yourself. Thank you, Yahweh. For his son, who's made it easier for us to have access to the father and to be washed by his blood, to deny ourselves and carry our cross doesn't look like what he did, where he literally shed his blood, pouring his blood out his, for us, backs in strips of ribbons for us, in anguish physically, spiritually, mentally, mentally, in every other way. We have not struggled. Let us throw it off, gouge it out, cut it off, whatever it is in our hearts. Now. And as we move forward and things come up, don't play with it. Lastly, we need to turn to God. Step four is turn to God. I thought we were turning to God. You, we are. <laughs> we are. The confessing, the forgiveness, the turning from sin. But we also need to make sure that we're not just turning away from uh, sin. 
but we actually turn him toward God. And that's why you hear that in the language that we read. A religious man spends his life avoiding sin. A repentant man seeking righteousness. Right? What's your focus? Avoiding sin, seeking righteousness. To continue the story with Josiah, after he tore down all these poles and desecrated these places and smashed these things into pieces, he didn't stop there. He went on and says, the king gave this order to all the people. Celebrate the Passover to Yahweh your God. All right, so now let's hold the festivals that he called for us, as is written in the book of the covenant. Neither in the days of the judges who led Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, had any such Passover been observed. But in the 18th year of King of Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to Yahweh in Jerusalem. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the mediums and the spiritists, all these people that um, were supposed to play in this role in uh, consulting spirits and stuff, got rid of them, the household gods, the idols, and all the other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. This he did to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book that Hilkiah, the priest, had discovered in the temple of Yahweh. Neither before nor jo after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to Yahweh as he did. Oh, I love that statement. Wouldn't it be cool to have your name there? No one before or after had turned to Yahweh. Not that it's a competition, but I would just want to be the one to say, I'll turn to you. I'll come to you. Even if no one else does in my family, even if no one does in my community or church, even if no one does in my nation, I don't care. I'm going to turn to you like nobody's ever turned before. But we give the best of our energy and strength and time and money to other things than completely going all in like that. And we should turn to God in that same spirit. It says with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength in accordance with all the law of Moses. So he didn't just remove, he reinstituted what was right. He didn't just remove, I'm going to stop this sin. No, he reinstituted. Because the, the fact of the matter is, it's possible that people can live good lives avoiding sin, but not actually turning back to God. <coughs> Matter of fact, many do that, not caring for anything about God, but they avoid sin because they understand the cost of sin. Even if they don't call it that, they say, I'm not going to do those things, but they don't turn to God. So don't be deceived by uh, what looks to be a healthy and good life does not necessarily mean this person is sold out to Yahweh for that's a whole other level. Matthew 6 gives us the focus. Yeshua says, so don't worry about these things. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Both kingdom and righteousness is his. Yahweh, seek him first. That's, the, that's what we should be seeking. Not chasing the things of this world. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? How am I going to pay for this? How am I going to pay for that? Not that we can't think about those things, but worry has to do with fear. He says, don't worry about that. And early he talks about, look at the birds, look at the grass. They eat, they have plenty of clothes, and they're here today, gone tomorrow. Saving your life isn't the first thing. He earlier, another, another verse says, those who save their, try to save their life will lose it. That's not the first thing. And the first thing is not even avoiding sin. That's my first thing. I can't sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Now, of course, we know what's going to happen if that's your focus. Don't sin. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do that. That's not the focus. The focus is seek him. Seek God. Turn to him. It's not confessing. It's not going to church. All these things are important and they come by way of repentance. But that's not the focus. First, seek God. Turn our lives. Turn your life. My life that we are seeking him and saying, I want a relationship with you. I want to know you. I want to be have intimate uh, oneness with you. And because I want intimate and, and intimacy and oneness with you, I don't watch the same things anymore. I don't wear the same things. I don't choose to talk the same way. I don't use the same language. I don't know if it's me, but it feels like today more and more people are choosing to use foul language. I hear children use it now. Uh, when I go to track meets with my daughter or just out in public, I'm just shocked. I'm like, has it always been this way? But we don't turn that way. We say, I want to be with you so much that I watch how I talk, how I dress. Even if it's not foul language, how I, am I gossiping? Am I 
um, having a spirit that you want. What am I think? I, I want you. You are my focus. You are my desire, Yahweh. So I won't commit these things. But the focus of in too often in church and in the religious settings, we can focus on the sin. You know, there was even a practice, I believe, a big word, asceticism, this practice of punishing yourself and hitting yourself and such. Because that was the focus is I shouldn't be saying anything to punish myself. Well, the focus is Yahweh. Peter calls a crowd to repent and turn to God after they hearing about this. And here's what he says, the same thing. Now, fellows, now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he has foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing might come from Yahweh and that he might send the Messiah who has been approved, appointed for you, even Yeshua. As I mentioned earlier, it is possible to stop sinning and not turn to God. He says, repent and turn to God. Turn away from those things and turn to God. Um, some have um, adopted healthier lifestyles. They're eating better. They're exercising better. They're doing meditative practices. They do things like yoga and organic eating. Um, all these things. They're turning from an unhealthy lifestyle, which often involves sin. They're not going to be sleeping around anymore. They're not going to talk like all these great things. Don't get it twisted. In other words, don't be deceived in thinking that here is a godly man or woman. No, they may have repented or turned from that sin or turned from those bad practices. But turning to God is something altogether different. Don't fall into this category of thinking I used to do all those things, but now I don't. Well, great. That doesn't mean you repented and turned to God. That just remember that just means you stopped doing those things. Now we need to seek righteousness. We need to seek his kingdom first. Everything we do first. What is how does this align with his kingdom and his righteousness? Before I do anything, how does this align with his kingdom and his right? Especially if it's something challenging. I'm struggling um, with an idea or anger. What, what I'm about to do, how does this align with his kingdom and his righteousness? See, I'm turning to God. What does his word say about this? Don't ask the questions, what's wrong with it either, right? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? No, no, no. What's right with it? See, I want to know how can I be right with God? Turn to him, not simply turning away from. Repentance cannot long be, it cannot be hidden for very long. It will produce fruit. It will produce fruit. We mentioned that, we saw that with uh, Second, uh, Second Corinthians with Paul, when he says, here are the fruits, you know, what earnestness, what eagerness. Repentance like seeds is planted in one's mind and they produce fruit. These fruits, when you see them in the scripture, I'm talking about actions, things you can see. The seed is on the ground, but the fruit comes out on the tree. You can see that this is the fruit of the tree. You recognize the tree by its fruit. We cannot claim that we repent while we never bear fruit in keeping with that repentance. We can't. John the Baptist talked to a group of, he rebuked the group of Pharisees for having such an attitude. Pharisees, these guys who would teach but not do, who were known to be hypocrites. And he says to them in Luke 3, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized with him, you brood of vipers. Wow. <laughs> Look at the language. <laughs> you snakes. You brood. Everyone knew that you uphold these laws on their, over, over everyone's head, but you don't do them. So you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Mm. See, this further highlights that repentance is not the fruit. See, look what I did. I'm doing this now. I'm doing this great thing. Um, repentance. Fruit comes from the repentance we have produce fruit in keeping with, with the repentance. Repentance should be already happening inside in our minds and our spirit. Now, where is the fruit of that? And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. We don't have to produce fruit. <laughs> for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. It is important that we understand that uh, John is referencing their actions, their words, their lives when he says fruit. Everyone knows that in this audience. We asked the question earlier, is it a salvation issue? 
and you already start to hear this language again. It will, if the tree doesn't bear good fruit, it will be cut down and thrown into the fire. There's no other way of seeing it. That's not a good place. Being cut down and thrown into the fire. If we refuse to cut off fruit that is not in alignment with repentance, then our tree will be cut down and burned into the fire. Either we cut it off and put it in the fire, or we will have to go with it and be cut off and thrown into the fire. So just as Paul mentioned earlier, godly sorrow produces this fruit. Now, when the people heard this, they started asking for examples. What do you mean? What do you mean? And there were likely some sincere hearts there uh, from different walks asking, give me some examples of what it can mean. And I love that we have some. What should we do? Then the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should share, should do the same. Very clear practicals. The point is, it depends on where you are and what you have and what you're doing. In this case, don't be greedy. You got two shirts and you see someone without one, give to that person. You got some food and someone doesn't give to that person. Tax collectors, what about them? Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what shall we do? Well, tax collectors had a reputation from st for stealing. So he says, don't collect any more than you are required to. That's what you should be doing. See, all this is returning back to Yahweh. Some soldiers asked him, what shall we do? He replied, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. I love it. Gave very clear practicals. What would the message be for me? What would the message be for you now? If we were to ask, what does that mean to Yahweh? For me to repent. Well, do this or don't do that. There was a man named Zacchaeus who showed us another example of repentance. He was a tax collector, and this is what he did. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone else and from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Wow. So we see here a tax collector. He says, look, I'm going to give half. Why? Because he understood that my repentance needs to show up. Now I can do the thing and not repent, but we can't say that we repent and not have any fruit that shows it. Now that doesn't mean everybody's going to see it, but there needs to be fruit that comes from that. So this is not a principle that Zacchaeus made up. You know, John talked about as well. Um, uh, restore back what you've done wrong. Give to the person who's in need. But this one in particular is talking about restoration. So we see this in uh, Numbers 5. When he, when Yahweh teaches restitution, this is a principle that he has and, and still has that we should ha have the attitude to follow. Yahweh said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and is so and, is, and so is unfaithful to Yahweh is guilty and must confess the sin that they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong that they have done. So the first thing they got to make full, they completely restore it, right? You, um, you busted my lights out. You got to restore my lights. Um, add a fifth of the value to it and give it to all the, give it all to the person that they have wrong and give a fifth, 20%. So this spirit of let me give half, let me give four times those. Why? Because it's not a one-to-one. -one. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm sorry. It will do it. Or even a good idea is like, let me give you another one. But the the godly principle says, if you're going to show the fruits of repentance here and want to truly restore the way he says, give 20 percent more. Or basically, how can I do even more? How can I make this right? One of the questions we ask in our home when when our girls get into it and if somebody's wrong is how can I make this right? Not just simply saying sorry or here is this piece to make up for. But what can I do to make restore the relationship? Yeshua makes it clear that repentance is not a suggestion, but a necessity for those who want to enter eternal life. And he looks at this through the lens of fruit, as we did earlier. Now, we saw this already when we talked about uh, repentance. We, we, in, the, in the beginning, we talked about, will I perish if I don't repent? Because he was talking to this group and says, oh, my goodness, all you will perish if you do not repent. So remember, he's talking about repentance as he goes to the next verse. Listen to what he says. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. 
Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Do you really think they're talking about trees and fruit like apples and cherries and stuff? Do you think we're really talking about fertilizing? No, this is a parable. And right after he spoke about repentance, he talks about this parable. As we go through parables, we need to understand that trees are often identified as men and the fruit from those trees are identified as the actions of those men, the behavior, the attitudes, the words, the actions of those men. So when Yeshua gives this parable, which is meant to stand for something bigger, obviously he's connecting to something else. In this case, it's clear it's the repentance. Seeking, now we read that with the mind, he says he came seeking fruit on it. I'm looking for the fruit. You said you repented. You said, I believe in you and I've given my life to you and I follow you and I've been uh, praying and going to church and read my Bible. He said, where's the fruit that comes from this of repentance? Where's the fruit that says a clear uh, out of, of indignation of wanting to clear yourself of turning to God? Where is it? I'm looking for it. And because none was found, he says, cut the tree down. Same language that John spoke. This is not uh, ironical. This language is very clear for those who are listening. If the tree doesn't bear fruit, it would be um, cut down and thrown into the fire. People understood trees and fruits in agriculture back then. It's a very clear analogy that we cannot afford to miss. Yeshua is looking for fruit in keeping with our repentance. He even goes on to say, why even keep it here? It's just taking up space. Wow. Every time I wake up, I'm grateful to have another day to repent, another day to give glory to God, another day to grow close to him. If I've done anything wrong, I can repent of it and move closer. And amen. But if we're living in sin and not turning, since he says, I've come to call sinners to repentance, then what are you doing? You're just sitting here, taking up space. And we hear the, uh, the the man say to him, just let's just give us some time. You might be in that phase right now where Yahweh says, Let, let's give him some time. Give us some time. Yeshua may be pleading on the on, on your behalf. Give us some time. Give us some time. This may be your moment. I don't know where you are, where you are. I can't see you through the screen. I don't know on the spectrum of religion and worldliness where your acts acts are and all these things. I don't know how you're perceived by the world and more importantly, how you're perceived by God. But I implore each one to examine his heart, whether he is a person of renown and respect and religion or whether he hasn't been one for a long time. Doesn't matter. You have the opportunity now to hearing these words and you could be in that moment where he says, give it some time. Let's dig around it. Let's fertilize it. This may be the digging and the fertilizing process to plant his word back in you, stir you up to holiness, stir you up to repentance and God, repentance and godliness that says, I got to stop and do something. I can't just keep showing up every day in my life, not repenting of things that I know are clearly, clearly um, uh, inviting the wrath of God in my life and into this world. I can't. It has to stop. Make that decision. Confess it. Ask for forgiveness. Turn away from the sin. Smash it. Cut it down, gouge it out, cut it off, and then turn to God. I don't know where we are. It's easy to, if you're religious to say, I'm already there. This is for other people. But I want to remind us that he wasn't speaking to uh, the ungodly. Most of the time he was speaking to us, to those who us who are seeking to be in his kingdom. The writers of the books, the Hebrews and Paul and such, they're saying, put it to death. You, yes, you believer, you at church so-and-so, stop for something worse happens. Stop because this is your moment. Stop thinking this message is for somebody else. This message is for you. God has found you out. He's, he's found you wanting and he knows where you are. You're not fooling anybody. Repent and turn. There's anger and bitterness in your heart. Turn. If there's a seat because you've been fooling everybody. Turn. If there's addictions, he says, turn. 
whatever it is, turn from from it and back to me. This is your moment. Regardless of what people say, you're okay. Everybody does it. Yahweh, your master, is telling you now he's not okay. His scriptures are ringing clear. If no fruit is found, that tree will be cut down and thrown into the fire. One of the final stories I want to close with is the prodigal son that captures it so well. The parable of the prodigal son Yeshua comes up with. He makes up this story in order to help us see this beautiful, uh, so many things here, but I want to point out repentance in God's heart. In Luke 15, to set the stage, then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there was a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields of the, uh, to feed swine. And he would And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. That's the setup. Here is a man who asked and demanded his inheritance from his father. Before it was time, wasted his money in prodigal living. And now he's humbled, spent all his money. A a famine has come and now he's found himself feeding pigs. The stage is set now. For you and I, if we're here, if we found ourselves uh, dancing around the edges of religion, only thinking it was for those people, those holy people, those religious, that's not me. That should be you. God has done too much for you not to go all in. Oh, but that's I'm not the minister type. I'm not the holy. I'm not. He says, no, all of us are called to be priests, called to be a holy nation, to call to go all in. No more simply just showing up and hanging around and looking outside through the windows of his kingdom. It's time to come in all the way. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. The stage is set for us to have the opportunity for that. Now what happens next? We'll never forget. But when he came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I love that words, those words. And he came to himself. See, this is the point that the repentance is happening. He says, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The returning is starting to happen. He's drawn himself back to his father. His father is representative of someone. The father, he's saying he came to himself. Now he's coming back. And we need to come back and says, hold on. What am I doing? Uh, this ain't working. I didn't try to do it my way. I didn't try to go after this happiness in this world my way and try to have comfortable religion and do things. It's time for me to come back to myself, come back to my senses. He says, I will rise and go to my father. There it is. This is this. He hasn't done it yet, but already the repentance is set in. His mind is changed. He's turning. I'm going to go to my father. Some just say those words. I'm going to return to my father. That's it. That implies that I've been there before. This is my home. This is my real place. It's time to come home now, baby. It's time to come home now, he says to us. And he's been patient with us and given us all this breath and life and energy and health and time to make this decision. Now he says. It's time to come back to my dad. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your high servants. And he arose and came to his father. You see, all this played out in his head. Isn't that beautiful? He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to arise and go to my father and I'm going to say to him. Right now, in this moment, you can repent and say, I'm going back to my dad, my heavenly father. I don't know what your relationship was like with your earthly father. But your heavenly father says, I await you. I have so much more. Whether it was good or bad or in between, he says, I am the perfect father. Come back. Come back to me. But I've never known you. He says, I knew you. Come back. I created you and I know you. Come back. 
And he arose. And so he has this thinking going through his head. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your highest. I'm playing it through. I'm just going to come and I'm just going to be barely able to be here. And that's going to be good enough for me now. Before I was entitled and felt like I owned everything. Now I just feel like if I can just get in, if I can just be in his presence, if I can just be a servant, how awesome would that be? He's already coming back in his heart. Now, guess what? The fruit of his repentance happens in verse 20. And he rose and came to his father. There it is. See, the fruit is going to always come out. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran on him and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is what happens when we turn back to our father. Listen, if we need to repent, we need to repent. If you need to repent, whether it be now or in a future time, share this, by the way. If you know someone who needs to be reminded of the importance of repentance. Which is everybody. <laughs> Because Yeshua starts his ministry out with this. He makes this story so that we can see that it's still possible for this man. He's alive. He's messed up. But the father will embrace you with a kiss and a hug. As you repent and come back. Don't be like the Jewish audience that Paul spoke to in Romans 2. Who was judging everybody for what they should do. Right? I'm religious. I know you should be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be. He says, no, no, no. You need to repent. Look at yourself. Let's look at that. Romans 2, he says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? He says the whole point was to lead you to repentance. You're taking advantage of his kindness, his patience, his forbearance. He's still letting you live. You got breath in your lungs. You're intelligent. You got strength in your hands and arms and legs. You can listen to this a uh, lesson on your phone or computer. You're living well. He says, don't take advantage of that. Don't misunderstand his kindness and his forbearance, not realizing that it's here to lead you to repentance. It's not here just to make you comfortable and say, I don't need God. He says, no, I'm doing this so that you can come back to me and you can call others back to me. Heed this call. I want to close with the same words we open with. Because I believe that Yeshua started his ministry with these words for a reason. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. And believe the good news. Let's recap. Repentance was the main theme of Yeshua's message and the message he gave his disciples to preach. Refusing to repent is a salvation issue. This is not something we can do without or just add on later. This is a crux. We have to turn back to him. Repent, repent, repentance means to turn back and or change our mind in that process. Repentance does not mean feeling sorrow or, or remorseful, though godly sorrow can lead us to repentance. Good fruit is a byproduct of repentance. We should expect it. Um, he respects us for sure because he comes looking for it. The four steps we outline on the road to repentance that we see in scripture is confess, ask for forgiveness, turn from sin, and turn toward Yahweh. I hope this lesson has been an encouragement, maybe a conviction, maybe an inspiration. Share it, like it, subscribe. But may Yahweh bless the hearers and doers of his word. May he, has mercy, may he have mercy on us all. Yahweh bless you, and I'll see you next lesson.